Welcome back to To The Point. Campaigns, particularly campaigns for president, can be very partisan and polarizing. That's just the nature of politics. But at a time when we will all be bombarded by a lot of my candidate is better than your candidate, there's a group of U.S. House members that have a different message. 25 Democrats, 25 Republicans make up what they call the Problem Solvers Caucus. I recently sat down with three members of the group, two from Michigan, Democrat Debbie Dingell and Republican Fred Upton, plus Republican Congressman Tom Reed of New York, the caucus co-chair, to talk about the group and what they hope to achieve. Mr. Chairman, I want to start with you. Just talk to me a little bit about this caucus, unique in its nature, an even makeup of Republicans and Democrats, and you have taken on some significant issues trying to find common ground where common ground can be found. How does that happen? Well, it's great to be with you first, Rick, here in Michigan with uh, two great colleagues, Debbie Dingell and obviously Fred Upton, uh, to show support uh, for the Problem Solvers Caucus. And uh, these are great, uh, two great leaders, and they represent what we are in the Problem Solvers Caucus. We're proud Republicans, we're proud Democrats, uh, but at the heart, uh, we're pragmatic. Uh, we want to get things done for the American people. And what we have done with this caucus is to officially bring together 25 Republicans, 25 Democrats, who are willing to stay in the room to find common ground. And we have done it on some of the hardest issues uh, that have faced this nation, and we're con con going to continue to do it. Congresswoman, we are a few blocks away from the museum of Gerald R. Ford, who as a member of Congress uh, was certainly a partisan, but also was able to find common ground working across the aisle. How difficult is it, and how difficult is it for you to be a part of this group with some of your own Democratic caucus who might not see eye to eye with, with that kind of cooperation? So, Rick, first of all, it's good to be with you and to welcome Tom to Michigan. And I'm very proud to be sitting here. Many people may not know it, but I'm a member of the board of the Gerald Ford Library and the Ford School at the University of Michigan, both boards, and very proud of it. Uh, Jerry Ford and my husband were good, close friends, and they worked together. And when I married John, Betty Ford took me under her wing and just helped me have so many different things. I, 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 I can't tell you, and the kids continue to be wonderful friends. And they, they brought different perspectives, they had different ideas, but they probably agreed on more than they disagreed. And they knew that you could go into a room and have an intense exchange of ideas, but you left that as friends. And they were Americans first. They found that common ground. They did what was right for the country. They didn't do what they did because they were a Republican or a Democrat. They did what they did because it was right for this country. And I think that's what the three of us here do and what we're trying to do with our colleagues is to bring that respect and civility back that used to be there. And we need to bring it back or this country's in trouble. When we talk about that kind of experience, and we talk about your experience in Washington going back to the Reagan administration, how much different do things look on Capitol Hill today than when you were there as a staffer? And how do you get back uh, to what the Congresswoman was talking about, that kind of civility? Well, I'll confess, I think you all would, it's a lot different than it was way back when. You know, may, maybe a lot of reasons, maybe because of the money you have to raise uh, to win. Uh, easily now it's two to five million dollars uh, for folks to, to raise. That's a, that's a lot. Uh, you don't have the maybe the relationships, uh, particularly with the newer members. Uh, we, all of us pretty much go home every weekend, so you're, you're not there, kids or others, spouses. Uh, but one of the things that the problem solvers did, and we identified this early, you know, how do we get through this partisan crap? We had to change the rules, uh, and we did. Uh, credit to the Democrats, as well as the Republicans, but they were in the hot seat because they, they took the majority two years ago. They said, we're not gonna vote for the speaker, and Republicans would have done the same thing, unless we change the rules to make this more bipartisanship. Co-sponsorships count, working together, having a seat at the table with the speaker and others. Uh, we're routinely asked for our opinion. And our block of 50 votes, that makes a difference. The White House has reached out to us. I mean, that's how, frankly, we ended the 35-day shutdown of last year. And we were called, many of us, into the Situation Room, both Republicans and Democrats. And we walked the president through on how we could get through this. And you know what? The next day it happened. Uh, we worked on immigration reform. We worked on a whole number of different things. We're working on 
uh, civil justice issues. We got a I've been working with Karen Bass, the head of the Congressional Black Caucus. We're very close to getting something done. White House reached out to us, to, you know, in this next COVID package. What is it? You know, it's it ought to be easy what, what we ought to be doing, and, and it ought to be out of this partisan gridlock. And we're going to be a key, I think, in the door to try and get that thing done. We had a discussion. You were having the discussion, and I was kind of in your orbit and listening. Uh, but you're all hearing a lot about the post office and what's happening with the United States Postal Service. How do you as a group, or do you as a group, weigh in on that? And how do you try to, A, guarantee uh, a efficient and inexpensive delivery of parcels, particularly to remote areas and rural areas where that may not have access to other types uh, of mail service? And how do you also make sure it's funded and make sure it's reliable all at the same time? Well, you know, it, it, it's actually interesting because the Postal Service is one of the, when Fred was talking about the rules change, one of the things that we got through on that rules change uh, was the relief to the Postal Service on a bill that went through the House in a huge bipartisan basis to relieve the pension obligation uh, that o the Postal Service has a, uh, a unique uh, overfunding uh, requirement that uh, has been put on it. And it's causing huge fiscal problems to the Postal Service. So we got that out of the House on that rule reform because of the Problem Solvers Caucus uh, effort. Now, going forward, you know what we're dealing with with the postal issue is obviously it's getting caught up in election politics and th there's always a concern about election integrity um, but this is uh, not about uh, that in my uh, humble opinion um, in my opinion what the Postal Service is about is making sure that the mail continues to flow making sure that the mail has the access to the resources to make sure that it can deliver it's in the Constitution I mean <laughs> the Postal Service is there and we need to make sure we stand uh, with it as a Republican I support it now the concern about you know universal mail-in uh, ballot that's different than absentee ballot and the security of the election should be something we all agree uh, should be something that we're concerned about and if anybody thinks they can play games with an American election they should understand you're going to jail if you do that but at the end of the day people should have access to ballots they should have access to mail because in a COVID-19 situation you know there are risks that have to be addressed and using the mail system if people so choose to do that that's their right to so elect to do that. Our interview took place outside, socially distanced in downtown Grand Rapids. And you will see the second half of our interview in next week's show, along with a recap of the Republican conviction. I'll be right back with the final thought next.